Professor Petrus Tinius uh, Junius, who is a professor and assistant department head of computer science at Purdue University. Uh, his research interests are in the design and analysis of randomized algorithms for a wide variety of linear algebra problems, with particular em emphasis on modern massive data sets and analysis of population genetics. Uh, he has many awards. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. He has won the Outstanding Early Research Award from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, as well as an NSF Career Award. Um, he's giving a talk entitled Randomization in Numerical Linear Algebra. Uh, thank you very much for participating in our session, and please take it away. Thank you very much, Arvind. I very much appreciate you putting together this uh, working group. I'm very much looking forward to the semester. And uh, I'm going to try to give uh, a little bit of an introduction uh, to the area and talk about, um, you know, this is an area that now has been going on for about 20 years. So I want to discuss a little bit uh, progress in the area, lessons that we learned over the past uh, 20 years. And I've been one of the individuals that have been working in this area essentially from its beginnings when I was a graduate student. Uh, so let's see what at least I learned over the past 20 years from working in this area. So first of all, um, let's take it easy and um, ask the question, why randomize the uh, algorithms for linear algebra? And the answer is that to a certain extent, randomization and sampling are well-known resources, especially in theoretical computer science. So I'm using the shorthand TCS for theoretical computer science to design provably accurate approximation algorithms for problems that are either massive, by massive, I mean matrices, for example, that would be so large that you wouldn't be able to store them at all. Think, I don't know, petascale matrices, I guess, these days at least. Or you could only store them in slow memory devices. So really, accessing those matrices would be at a premium. You'd pay a lot of computational time just to access those matrices. So in that case, perhaps you want to come up with algorithms that uh, leverage randomization and sampling to perform some operation on these matrices. So this is for massive matrices. But also randomization and sampling, especially when it comes to theoretical computer science, they are a resource that is used to design approximation algorithms for problems that are computationally expensive or even NP-hard. Now, NP-hard problems in linear algebra are not that common. But as numerical linear algebra and linear algebra has become, has become essentially the workhorse, if you will, behind data mining and machine learning and the other AI applications, now, problems that are actually computationally expensive and NP hard and have a very natural linear algebraic formulation appear more and more. So such problems include, for example, the column subset selection problems, sparse PCA, sparse approximations, uh, k-means, perhaps the fundamental uh, clustering problem, and of course associated algorithms, they can be cast very neatly as a linear algebraic problem. Let me try and summarize some of the ideas that I will expand on in this talk in one slide. So, think of randomized, randomized algorithms in numerical linear algebra typically have uh, two components. One component is randomized algorithms themselves. How do you apply randomized algorithms in linear algebra? The other component is more linear algebraic, if you will. Things like matrix perturbation theory and so on and so forth. So let's start with a very, very simple problem, like approximating the product of two matrices. And actually, I'm picking A and A transpose. So this is the covariance matrix or the gram matrix um, in uh, machine learning. And just to approximate this product, if you don't want to compute it exactly, let's say, you could do the following very simple trick. You could pick a few columns, let's say, from the matrix A, put them into the matrix C, so that you form a sketch of A. And now you approximate the product AA transpose by CC transpose. The question is, how do you sample those columns? How do you pick them? And you could select them uniformly at random. That's a very easy way, of course, to select columns. But that's probably not the best idea. If you select columns uniformly at random, think of a matrix that has, let's say, a single non-zero uh, column, then the probability of selecting that column is pretty small. So what you actually want to do is you want to come up with better probability distributions. So I'm using the word carefully here. And that's one of the things that we studied fairly exhaustively and extensively in, in randomized linear algebra. 
Once you form that sketch, you want to argue something along the following lines that let's say AA transpose minus CC transpose. So this is your exact matrix product minus the approximate, the sketched matrix product. You want to say that those two quantities are close and how do you do that? Well, let's bound some norm of the difference. You could pick the two norm, the Frobenius norm or other uh, certain norms, whichever norm you want. But whatever you pick, as long as you apply a randomized algorithm to sketch, to sample rows or columns, let's say from the two, from the, your matrices, you're going to have an error. And that error will be bounded with probability. So that's where probability will enter. You're going to get some bound for the quantity, let's say AA transpose minus AC transpose, and that bound will hold with some probability. This is one aspect of randomized, applying randomized algorithms to linear algebra. You sample rows or columns. You could also sample elements. There has been a lot of work on element-wise sampling from matrices, sparsified basically your matrix. Another aspect would be, not, don't sample carefully, but do something in your matrix that makes essentially all the rows, all the columns, all the elements in your matrix equally important. Interestingly, there is a way to do that. I'll come back to this in a few slides. But there is a way to pre-process, so that's the alternative. There is a way to pre-process your matrix using this random projection type matrices that I will discuss a little bit later, and Gunnar will also talk about some of these things in his talk. And now, once you do this pre-processing, you don't have like significant rows, significant columns, significant elements. Pretty much everything has the same significance, and now you can really do uniform sampling to create your sketch. So these are the two predominant ways, basically, to create the sketch. Once you have actually created such a sketch and you have provided a bound like this one right here, then you can go back and say, you know what, now AA transpose and CC transpose are closed. They have a bounded to norm difference, let's say. So I can go back and say that the singular values of AA transpose, which are, of course, connected to the singular values of A, and the singular values of CC transpose, which are, of course, connected to the singular values of C, are close to each other. So you can start saying that since the original matrix and the sketch are closed, since you have some bounded uh, difference between the original matrix and the sketch, their spectral properties are similar. So you can start saying things that their singular values are close or the singular subspaces or the singular vectors uh, of the uh, matrix and the sketch are close as well. So interplay, this is an area that grew out in some sense out of theoretical computer science at the same time out of applied math as well. So my background is in TCS, for example. Um, TCS gave us ideas for randomized and approximation algorithms. On the other hand, applied mathematics, of course, uh, we use that all the time for matrix computations, perturbation theory. And I particularly like this part here, probability theory, and in particular, measure concentration inequalities for sums of random matrices. Again, I think this is one of the significant lessons that we learned over the past 20 years, and I'll come back to this. And it's not just theory, there is also applications, and one of the um, a, a fundamental area where some of these algorithms have been applied is in big data analysis. Think of it as data mining, machine learning. I work in bioinformatics, in particular in population genetics, and we apply some of these algorithms there to analyze real data. Highlights. So, Again, if you look at this area, I would say that its beginnings were in the very late 1990s, 99, 2000. And then for about 20 years, we've seen hundreds, if not thousands of papers now on randomized linear algebra. And if I were to pick a couple of highlights, I think it would be the randomized algorithms for regression problems and the randomized approaches for matrix decompositions. I will mostly focus in my talk on the first part here. I think Gunnar will mostly talk about the second part. For matrix decompositions, think things like SVD and the related statistical process of principal components analysis. And why am I picking those as highlights? They've been algorithms for many other problems as well. But in some sense, these problems are fundamental in data science. I think it's really difficult to do data science if you don't know enough about regression and matrix decompositions. Uh, both problems are also at the heart of multiple disciplines computer science, numerical linear algebra, machine learning, applied mathematics, statistics, they all care about these problems, maybe from slightly different perspectives, but this is actually quite important. And both problems have a very rich history. They're old problems. They've been around for a while. Regression has been around for over 200 years. PCA has been around also for over 100 years. So there are fundamental problems. We really care about them. And I think we were able to give novel insights and approaches using randomized linear algebra. 
So what did we contribute? And I'll try over the next several slides to make this a little bit more precise. I think in a nutshell, we contributed faster, typically randomized, but not always. Sometimes we actually used randomization in the beginning for the analysis, but then switched to deterministic algorithms, approximation algorithms for the aforementioned problems. Novel methods to identify rows, columns, or elements of a matrix that are significant, that contain, if you will, information that is highly influential when it comes to applying, let's say, regression or computing principal components analysis. For example, regression, it's a bunch of constraints, a bunch of variables. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a bit. Uh, but one question that somebody could ask is, what are the influential constraints? Do we need all the constraints in linear regression? Can we drop a bunch of the constraints and still get an accurate answer? So a lot of these questions, we were able to actually answer them uh, using randomized approaches. And we developed concepts like the leverage and the ridge leverage scores to identify influential rows and columns. They were extended to element-wise leverage scores as well to identify influential elements. So identify pieces now of the matrix that are influential. There is another approach, complementary approach, called volume sampling to identify sets again of rows and columns that uh, span a subspace of maximal volume, basically. That's why it's called volume sampling. And again, these such sets of rows and columns are important. And interestingly, recently, over the past three, four years, we realized that the volume sampling and leverage scores are actually nicely connected. A third thing that I think we were able uh, to contribute over the past uh, 20 years is structural results and conditions that highlights some fundamental properties of problems like regression and PCA. What do I mean by this? Uh, in some sense, we had to deal with two different areas. A lot of these results were communicated uh, both to the numerical linear algebra community as well as the theoretical computer science community. And the different communities, the different communities sometimes care about slightly different things. So maybe numerical linear algebra paid less attention to randomization, whereas theoretical computer science paid less attention to the matrix operations. So one of the things we did over the past 20 years, a lot of us at least, we decoupled in some sense the randomized part of the algorithms from the deterministic part. So we were able to come up with conditions that if those conditions were satisfied by the randomized sketching that we performed, then good things would happen for the regression problem or the PCA problem. And I'm going to show you some of those conditions a little bit later in my talk for regression, just to give an idea of what this has happened, of how this happened, and also to highlight that this was kind of a novel contribution because of the way we actually thought about some of these problems. Lessons. So I'm going to move to three or four things that I learned over the past 20 years and that I also try to communicate to outsiders uh, of this area over the years. I think the first thing we learned is that sketching indeed works. So in problems where matrices are involved, I'll make it uh, more specific in my next slide, in problems where matrices are involved, in theory and in practice, you can often replace your matrix by a sketch, a few rows, a few columns, or more elaborate sketches, or a sparse matrix that is randomly sparsified. And as always, when you oversimplify things, this is good for the field because outsiders sort of, you know, can recall uh, one message, and that's a good message for them to remember. But on the other hand, it also hurts the field. And I'll explain how it hurts the field uh, in a minute. So, again, starting with the positive, sketching works. As I said, in problems that involve matrices, and there are numerous such problems, of course, using a sketch of the matrix instead of the original matrix can typically re result in good algorithms, meaning provably accurate algorithms, and in practice, it often works quite well. The sketch can be something really simple, like a few rows or a few columns or a few elements. You can select them carefully or not, depending on the application, depending on your background. The sketch can be a product of the matrix with a few random Gaussian vectors. So you take a few random Gaussian vectors, you hit your matrix with those random Gaussian vectors, you get a smaller matrix, that would be your sketch. And more elaborate sketches have been investigated in a lot of detail over the past 10, 15 years. So, the good news here is that sketching works and sketching is easy. It's something I'm teaching a high school, uh, a few high school students, I'm teaching linear algebra for data science to a few high school students this summer. And these are all ideas, at least the first two, 
just taking a product of a matrix with a few random Gaussian vectors or selecting Ross counts elements of a matrix, it's actually quite easy for them to implement in Python or Julia or MATLAB. It's, it's an easy approach. Maybe the proofs are not that simple, but the approach itself is quite easy. Why is that a bad thing also in some sense for the area? Because all of us, of course, we write more papers, we write more proposals, and um, whenever I write a proposal to the NSF and I talk about applying sketching to get another matrix problem, the first question that comes up and the criticism is, this is not transformative. We know that sketching works. So yes, sketching does work, but on the other hand, using the matrix sketch properly in downstream applications is highly non-trivial. And maybe we or I have done a bad job of communicating this uh, to the broader audience. So it's not just the sketch. It's not enough to take a sketch and then use it immediately for regression. There are better ways to do it. And in some sense, this is something that we are still trying to understand. And applying the sketch in novel ways, in non-trivial ways, carries a lot of value. So understanding the impact of the error, if you will, that is incurred by the approximation in the downstream application that you want to use the sketch on is challenging and novel. Downstream applications, they include all kinds of regression. As I said, the prototypical example for sketching was least squares regression, L2 regression. And that worked well, and you go back 15 years, that's when the first papers, uh, 15 or so years, that's when the first papers on regression started to appear. But fast forward to today, and for example, if you look at, let's say, logistic regression, which is the kind of regression that you solve by using iterative reweighted least squares problems, we don't know actually, or at least I have not seen an analysis of how to characterize the error as you move from one iteration to the next. So each one of the iterations, weighted least squares problems, we understand how they operate when sketching is done. But as you iteratively do it, the error propagates. And it propagates sometimes in ugly ways. So understanding this propagation, this iterative process, is certainly something we haven't done yet. So really the downstream application now is going to dictate the type of sketching we're going to do and whether we can even do sketching. Low rank approximation, I think it's one of the most successful cases. There we've actually analyzed uh, iterative processes as well at this point. So I think we understand uh, how to uh, use sketching to get low rank approximations quite well. Clustering algorithms, again, you go back 10, uh, 12 years, you're going to see some um, approaches that apply k-means, let's say, to a sketched matrix, and they worked reasonably well. They gave you constant factor approximations for the objective function. But then, like five years ago, uh, the Musco brothers and the late Mike Cohen and their collaborators were able to get relative error approximations by using cost-preserving projections. We still don't understand particularly well what happens to the actual clusters, let's say, when k-means um, is applied on the sketched matrix as opposed to the original matrix. Similar story for SVMs and other classification procedures. We can control, for example, the margin in SVMs by using sketching, but the actual classification accuracy, we know less about. And then you have iterative algorithms, first and second order methods for optimization, things like interior point methods. I'll talk about this hopefully a little bit towards the end of my talk, um, or other optimization approaches. And then again, there you have an iterative process, typically involves matrix computations, for example, solving the Newton equations. But can you sketch and still guarantee that the propagation of the error will be slow enough that the overall process actually converges to the optimal solution? So these are things, again, that I think we are now trying to understand a little bit better. So sketching, yes, it works, but actually taking the sketch and evaluating the downstream applications, that's a little bit harder. Third lesson, go back again 20 years, one of the things you are going to notice is that sketches uh, were used sort of in, in a one-pass approach. You took the matrix, you sketched the matrix, you apply whatever algorithm it was on the sketch, and that's it. For example, you want to approximate the singular values of the matrix, you just compute the singular values of the sketch. This, was, this made a lot of sense back then because um, there was a lot of hype behind uh, things like the streaming model, the pass efficient model, where the the resource that you could not control well was basically uh, the number of passes over the input. But as we moved on, we realized that in many cases, you can actually make multiple passes over the input. And in those cases, you are better off using your sketch either as a preconditioner or to compute a starting point for an iterative process. 
And I want to highlight, for example, that you could use the sketch as a preconditioner for iterative methods, let's say for regression problems, which is precisely what Blendepic did about 10 years ago. And then there have been many, many other follow-ups. Or you can use your sketch to compute a seed vector, if you will, in subspace iteration for SVD PCA or to compute a block rile of subspace. And there has been a lot of work there. I know that uh, uh, Gunnar will talk about some of that. Uh, so I wanted to highlight a couple of things that we did on our end with uh, Ilsa Ibsen and other collaborators over the past few years. And I should say that both these, neither of these is novel, of course, in numerical linear algebra. They're very heavily investigated. But the introduction of randomization to sort of construct the preconditioner and bound the condition number of the preconditioned matrix, plus uh, how to bound the original subspace, let's say, that you used to seed subspace iteration or block clear of um, subspace methods, this is actually quite novel. And I think there is still more uh, to be done there and more lessons to be learned because in the process we came up with alternative ways to think about some of these algorithms. One more lesson, or a couple more lessons. Uh, this one, when I realized that, it was, I think, back in 2004, 2005. You have a matrix. Let's take a tall and thin matrix A. Okay? And by tall and thin, I mean it's N by D with N much larger than D. And imagine that most of the information in this matrix, the useful information, for example, non-zero elements, are concentrated right here. And the rest of the matrix is irrelevant. If you want to sketch this matrix, you'd better figure out a way of selecting these informative rows, if you will. Well, there is a way to pre-process the matrix so that the information in your matrix is spread out throughout the matrix. And that way is very simple. Take X, an N by N matrix. This could be a matrix whose entries are random Ga Gaussian random variables, normal zero, one, just the simplest thing you can design. You pre-multiply A by X, so you still get an N by D matrix, but now this new matrix XA, all its rows are basically equally informative. And this is not uh, just you know, a high level statement. This can be made very precise. You, you actually uniformize the row leverage scores. And this can be made very precise. And then you can select a few rows from the resulting matrix for XA and use that as a sketch for it. And this is actually behind many of the sketching approaches. The difference is that instead of having an X right here, that is a random Gaussian, matrix, you have much better constructions for X. And you can post multiply a short and fat matrix, say, by a random Gaussian matrix or more efficient matrices and uniformize the columns of the matrix. And you can do it from both sides, left and right. And then you uniformize both rows, columns, as well as actually elements as well. And this is actually another lesson that we uh, learned over the past 20 years. And the last thing I want to highlight a little bit more, the symbiotic relationship between random LA, uh, randomized numerical linear algebra, and the world of matrix concentration inequalities, as well as the world of sketching. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, by matrix concentration inequalities, I mean the following kind of thing. You have, let's say, the sum of Xi from i equal one up to n. This is a sum of random variables. Think of those as being just real numbers for now, minus the expectation of the sum from i equal one up to n of the exam. And you want to understand how this is bounded. You want to understand how far a sum of random variables is from its expectation. When the random variables are real numbers, this goes back hundreds of years. So you can use things like Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality, or starting in the 1900s, uh, Bernstein, Chernoff, Hefting inequalities that show that as n grows, this is actually, this quantity here is very well concentrated around its mean. What if the x size are not numbers, but they are matrices themselves. So you now have a sum of random matrices. The study of these quantities, I think I would say it started um, to get attention in the early 2000s and then uh, towards the late 2000s, we had monographs by Joel and other people. And at this point, a lot of new inequalities have been developed to bound the sum of random matrices, how far away that is from its expectation. That has simplified the analysis of random NLA algorithms. That has simplified sketching tools that are used in random NLA algorithms. So this is, again, a very nice symbiotic relationship uh, with another area. I'm going to talk, as I said, about regression mostly and try to highlight some of the lessons that we learned within the context of regression. And I'm mostly going to do that because I think Gunnar will talk about uh, low-rank approximations and their specializations. Regression is fundamentally a statistical problem. 
Um, so I just want to uh, give you a little bit of background on how I think about regression because that also tells us something about uh, whether the number of variables, about the connection between the number of variables and the number of constraints. So typically here's what you have in regression. You are given observations, the TIs, and the response, YI. So TI is the input, YI is the output numbers. Okay, there is an underlying black box function Y that connects the output to the input. And we model this underlying black box Y as a linear combination of a few basis functions. Few, I mean B. The phi i's are known, the basis functions are known, the responses and the inputs are known. The only thing that is not known are the coefficients in the linear combination, the xi's. How do you solve for the coefficients? Well, you form the so-called design matrix, this n by d matrix A, whose ij entry is the value of ti for the function phi j. Again, all the details don't matter too much. What matters is that the basis functions are known, input is known, output is known. It's only the coefficients uh, in the linear combination that are not known. And then you solve this system basically right here. Y approximately equal to AX, as we'll see, doesn't have a unique solution. So the linear measurement model says that Y is indeed equal to AX plus some noise epsilon, noise vector epsilon. And now to estimate X, you solve the well-known regression problem. And you are looking at a least norm approximation. So you are trying to minimize the error between Y, your actual responses, and AX, your estimated responses. You solve for X and pick whichever norm you want. There. A very common choice, of course, is the two norm, the Euclidean norm. And that's least squares regression. Goes back a couple of hundred years, is applied throughout the sciences on when it comes to data analysis. So let's look at the random LA approach for this. So one thing that perhaps this discussion highlights is that you have D basis functions and you have N input points, input output pairs. So N, basically the observations versus D, basically the complexity of your model, if you will, the number of basis functions you are using. It makes a lot of sense to think of N, the number of observations, being considerably larger than D, to have an over-constrained model, basically. And this is indeed the first setting, I guess, that I would start thinking about when I think about regression. And it looks like this. You have A times the vector X opt approximately equal to B. So in numerical linear algebra and theoretical computer science as well, B is a more common uh, than Y. So I changed notation on you at this point. And that typically there is no solution. It's not like there is an X opt such that A X opt is equal to B, unless of course it happens that B is in the column space of A, but that's not necessarily the case. And you want to find the best X opt the XOP that minimizes the error, A XOP minus B. And I'll talk, this is the over-constrained case, so you have more constraints than variables, but I'll talk about the other two obvious cases, under-constrained case and square case a little bit later. We know how to solve this very well. It takes order n d square time. Remember, I'm assuming that n is considerably larger than d, so quadratic on the small dimension, linear in the large dimension, and there are numerically stable ways to solve it, including QR decomposition and the SVD. Random LA, one of the first things we understood about this problem is that not all constraints are equally important. It turns out that you can pick a few constraints, so like sampling rows of A, the corresponding elements to, of B, with respect to a univariate distribution, so just I'll give you PIs summing up to one for the rows of A, you sample with respect to that probability distribution with replacement, rows of A, the corresponding elements of B, and you solve the smaller problem. So here is your smaller problem. So the original problem had N constraints. This problem has R constraints. So fewer constraints. And how were they selected? I gave you a probability distribution. I'll discuss this in a minute. And you select rows of A with probability proportional to that, uh, probability proportional to that distribution. And now you solve this smaller problem. You solve for X tilde opt, this vector right here. And you ask how good is X tilde opt? So what do you do? You take X tilde opt you plug it back into the original problem. So you compute B minus AX tilde opt. It can never be better than the true optimal solution, of course, but it's not much worse. It's one plus epsilon worse with probability at least 80% and using standard techniques, you can amplify this to whichever number you want, one minus 10 to the minus 10, for example. And how many constraints did you need to keep in order to achieve this kind of result? Well, it turns out not that many. D over epsilon, where D is the number of variables of predictors in your problem, plus D log D. Epsilon is the relative error accuracy that you get right here. 
and it's linear in one over epsilon, linear in D, well, there is this extra log D factor that we're not gonna get rid of because of coupon collector type issues. What are the probabilities? What is this probability distribution that reveals this information? It turns out that these are the so-called leverage, leverage scores of the rows of A. So you compute the thin SVD of A. This is the left singular, the matrix of the left singular vectors of A. The columns of this matrix U are pairwise orthogonal and normal, but we don't know anything like that for the rows. So if you look at the rows of U, the only thing you know about the rows of U is that their norm, their Euclidean norm, lies between zero and one. And this is precisely the norms of the rows of U right here. This is precisely what you are gonna use as your sampling probability. And this is known actually in statistics, they were called leverage scores, and these raw leverage scores reveal influential constraints in over-constrained least squares problems. And you can compute them, of course, either by computing the SVD, but that's kind of cyclical because that takes a lot of time, or it turns out you can approximate them very well up to relative error, and that suffices uh, in time that is basically order ND, or as Clarkson and Woodruff uh, proved in their uh, best paper award uh, winning paper in stock in 13, in time proportional essentially to the non-zero entries of the input matrix uh, A. Or you can avoid leverage scores altogether because one of my slides before said that, you know what, you can actually uniformize the leverage scores and it turns out that indeed, if you take your matrix A, this tall and thin matrix A, and you pre-process by X, X times A will basically be a matrix that has uniform leverage scores, and now you can sample uniformly at random there. So here are the two ideas, right? You either sample carefully with respect to the raw leverage scores, or you pre-process and you sample uniformly at random. And we know a lot about how to construct these matrices X very, very efficiently so that they can be applied on A very fast. Um, I'll skip most of that, except to say um, the, the one thing I want to highlight here is the structural conditions so one thing I said is that we came up with structural conditions and for regression, they look like this. You have basically two conditions that say that as long as your matrix X, this sketching matrix I was talking about, or it could be a sampling matrix as well, as long as it satisfies those two conditions, don't try to understand them, there is no point to understand them right here. But as long as your sketching or sampling matrix satisfies those two conditions with high probability, we're done. You're gonna get the result that I promised. So this is kind of the structural results that we came up with. And in some sense, this says that, you know, if you have any new construction for X that satisfies those conditions, then that construction actually works. And the other thing I want to highlight is how measure concentration inequalities are used in the proofs. Typically at the heart, at least of this proof and a few other proofs as well, is the following uh, fact or interesting observation. Take a tall and thin matrix, UA, that is column-wise orthogonal. So the columns of UA are pairwise orthogonal and normal. Of course, not its rows. And sketch it using X. So you compute X times UA, where X now is your sketch. And it turns out that, of course, UA, all its singular values are equal to one. We know that very well. That's an orthogonal matrix. But it turns out that for X UA, that's also almost the case. All the singular values of the sketched orthogonal matrix are also one plus minus epsilon, basically. To prove this, you use measure concentration inequalities. So this is done via matrix concentration inequalities for matrices, measure concentration inequalities for matrices. Early proofs of this, if you go back 15 years, were complicated using tools like the Kinsey inequality. But as the years progressed with measure concentration inequalities for matrices, these are now half page proofs and you don't even need to understand uh, how to prove the matrix concentration inequalities themselves. You're just a user. All you need to do is use those inequalities. So this has made the field, as Joel said at some point, quite a bit more democratic. It's now easier to get into this field. And there is massive amount of follow-up work when it comes to regression. The next two pages basically highlight some of my favorite follow-ups, I guess, uh, on uh, uh, least squares regression using uh, randomization and sketching. Um, I'll actually, I was planning to talk a little bit about the under constraint case. I'll just mention the under constraint case, I guess. So the case where A now is an under constraint matrix. So A is short and fat, okay? So N variables, uh, N constraints, D variables. And in this case, if you think about the statistical interpretation of regression, it makes a lot of sense to regularize. So you want to control 
the two norm of the solution to avoid artifacts. You can do that by ridge regression where you control the two norm or you could do lasso type stuff and control the one norm or elastic net and control both. Turns out that an exact solution to under constrained regression has a form like this. This is one way to express it. And now AA transpose is the gram matrix and you can approximate this by sketching. And that's indeed one of the things that we did. This, I think, goes back to work done by Mark Tigert in the late 2000s. Uh, but in more recent work, we've now applied iterative methods like Richardson iteration in combination with the sketching, as well as preconditioned methods to solve this problem quite efficiently. Nice connections with leverage scores, rich leverage scores, and structural results. I think I'm going to skip all that. Uh, and instead move on to the square case. So under constrained, over constrained case, uh, the n much larger than d, n much smaller than d case. What about the n equal d case? Kind of the first thing you learn, if you will, in high school when you talk about linear algebra. Uh, one of the first things you learn is, of course, solving systems of linear equations, which is the square case. This case is harder. And for this case, in general, we actually do not know how to sketch. Special cases where we know how to sketch is when the input matrix A is a Laplacian. So it corresponds to a graph. And the reason we know how to deal with this case is because this case can be written if this is your n by n Laplacian, corresponds to a graph with n vertices. This corresponds to, a, this can be expressed as a matrix, as a matrix product that looks like this. Call this B, call this B transpose. M is the number of edges. N is the number of vertices, so it can be expressed as a product of an N by M, short fat, uh, N by M, the transpose, which is tall and thin, it can be expressed as the product of those two matrices. This is the edges in this matrix. And it turns out that it's exactly these matrices here that you can sketch using leverage scores, which are called effective resistances when it comes to graphs. You can generalize this. There is beautiful work by Spielman and Tegg to symmetric diagonally dominant matrices, but going beyond going to symmetric positive definite matrices beyond Laplacians, basically it's hard. And it might be fundamentally hard as a recent, uh, again, best paper, best student paper, uh, award-winning um, work by Zhang and Rasmus King showed a few years ago in Fox. If you are interested in this area, I would recommend this CACM article from like eight years ago by Gary Miller, Richard Peng, and uh, uh, Yanis Kutis uh, for a quick introduction in this area. Petros, can I ask you to wrap up in a couple of minutes? Yes, I'm wrapping it up. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, last thing I want to say um, to wrap up, uh, random LA and linear programming. Uh, that's something that we did with Aniva Chodhuri, my student, Palma London from Caltech and Hai Mavron um, uh, from the University of Tel Aviv. Uh, we now apply interior point methods and sketching combined with sketching to solve like the standard form of the primal LP. And one way to do it, we're looking at under constraint problems. So you have more variables and constraints. You want to compute in long step IPMs, which are the most relevant in practice, the Newton search direction by solving basically uh, the Newton uh, uh, equation, the normal equations, right? And since this is an under constraint problem, A times D, forget about what D exactly is, uh, is short and fat. So you can apply sketching. The difficulty there, is and we apply the preconditioned methods, conjugate gradient, uh, Richardson, steepest descent to solve this. Uh, the difficult part there is that once you solve this system approximately, then the update going to the next iteration is not feasible anymore. So you lose feasibility. So we have a trouble there, quite a bit of trouble, analyzing convergence because we lose feasibility. So we have to look at slightly infeasible interior point methods and their analysis. We actually chose, and it turns out that this is better, to correct for the error using a totally novel approach to correct for the error and make sure that the next iteration you're gonna get something feasible. Turns out you can do that efficiently, which is a little bit surprising, I think. And we argued that using these preconditioners does not increase uh, the complexity of IPM methods uh, in terms of the number of iterations while solving the system of linear equations that arises in interior point methods uh, considerably faster. So this is a new approach basically for long uh, step IPMs. Similar approaches were sort of analyzed for short step IPMs, at least theoretically. Our work also has experiments that connect this with L1 regularized SVMs and show how uh, they can be solved by under-constrained uh, linear programs and preconditioned interior point methods. 
And at this point, I mean, I'll mention that uh, there have been lots of events, of course, on Rand and LA, and this workshop is yet another event. Uh, and a number of uh, review articles, uh, quite a few written by Gunnar, a few written by me as well, including one, I think, by Gunnar and Joel that uh, will appear uh, right this year. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Petros. That was a great talk. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, are there any questions for Petros? If so, could you please uh, uh, raise your hand? Yeah, please go ahead, David. Yeah. Uh, Petros, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, instead of sketching the matrices, might you try doing something else, like averaging adjacent uh, columns or something like that? So that's, that's yet another way of sketching. And as a matter of fact, some of the sketching methods, uh, in some sense, if you hit a matrix by a random Gaussian, that's pretty much what it does. It basically puts a random variable on every single row, sums it up with a random weight. So it's some sort of averaging. So absolutely, this is a, this is a great idea. And 15 years ago, you'd win the best paper award for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, and the second question is, um, instead of using, um, random vectors to multiply these matrices by, perhaps we would use carefully designed vectors and then pick the rows that they multiply against at random. Correct. So the reason we use randomness is because it makes proofs simpler. So determinism there makes our life harder when it comes to proofs, but certainly I think in practice, that's what you'd like to do. The question there is similar to what happens with the so-called RIP conditions when it comes to compressed sensing. And there, a lot of the construction for the matrices have been randomized, deterministic constructions have been harder to come up with. And I think it's exactly the same story here. So I think in practice, deterministic constructions would be actually the right thing to do. But in many cases, their analysis becomes quite convoluted. So that's why I'm only pointing to the randomized aspect of things. But certainly there has been some work on deterministic constructions with weaker bounds in general, at least to the best of my knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions. So please raise your hands if you have any. Uh, so in the meantime, while we're waiting for it, maybe I can ask you, Sir Petros, maybe would you care to comment on, so you mentioned matrix concentration inequalities and I completely agree with you, but do you, do you so from your vantage point, do you feel there are other results in random matrix theory beyond matrix concentration that are powerful and something that we could explore? So, okay. So again, and that's something I've been writing proposals on for a while and I promised to solve and then I write the same proposal again and again, right? Uh, so one of the most powerful things that I think we haven't done yet is we use measure concentration equalities to say how close the sketch is to the original matrix. And then we separately use matrix perturbation theory, something like Viles inequality, some very simple stuff, basically, to argue that, you know, the sketch and the original matrix, their singular values are close. We have to combine the two. And I don't know how to do that. So I think using some sort of random matrix theory inside perturbations, inside matrix perturbation theory is the right way to go. Because right now we're using both tools sort of in an agnostic way, and if you will, in a pessimistic way. I mean, matrix perturbation theory is worst case. And in some sense, so are the um, matrix concentration results. Combining the two, I think, will be powerful. And as I said, I promise to do that all the time, and I haven't done it. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, your, your comment about writing proposals and uh, getting that comment yeah. is very well taken. I'm thanks. sure that people have seen that. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions, but uh, let's thank Ted Petros again. This is fantastic. Thank you very much.